We're in Nehemiah. We're in the sixth chapter. We're looking at this wonderful, wonderful book. And today's sermon is really titled, Oh No to Oh No. Now, Oh No is not the one that was married to John Lennon. Oh No is the plain of Oh No, which was a plain outside the Jerusalem, a ways, and somebody was trying to trap Nehemiah, and they wanted him to come out to the plain of Oh No. You know, it's dangerous when your enemies want you out where you're vulnerable, and uh, then they can take advantage of you. And in this sixth chapter of the book of Nehemiah, we're going to see why Nehemiah said, Oh no, <laughs> I'm not going to Oh no. And that's what he did. In fact, I'm going to take you through the um, first nine verses, and we'll read Nehemiah 6, chapter, verses 1 through 9. When word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messages to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time Sambalat sent this, his aide to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us confer together. I send him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. And, but I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Let's speak to the Lord for just a moment, if we may. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We believe it's the revealed truth of yourself. And we ask this morning that you would speak to us, that you would give us something we haven't seen before. Give us something, Father, to live by. Provide it in our hearts and minds, but let us apply it to our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As I'm always in the custom of reminding you, that's the important thing about taking the scriptures. It's not just knowing it. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up. Oh, I know this and I know that. And it, even beyond that, it's what do you believe? Do you believe the word of God? Does it mean something? And then on top of that, how do you apply it? Remember? From my head to my heart to how I put it in my life to my hand. And that's what's so important for each one of us. And I want to draw you back to the last verse of chapter 5. Somebody reminded me, one of these students that I've been preaching to uh, in the pews said to me, you, never, you know, I, I found that last verse interesting. I said, I know because I'm picking it up for next week. And here we are today. This is what Nehemiah said in the 19th verse of chapter 5. Remember me with favor, O oh my God, for all I have done for these people. Nehemiah was busy about the work. Nehemiah was busy about doing the things of the Lord. And even though these people had all kinds of issues and all kinds of things that needed to be done, Nehemiah said, Lord, just remember me that I've, I've done these things. Don't forget me. And sometimes it's not easy when you're trying to establish in your life a spiritual vision. You're trying to walk as a Christian should walk. You're trying to go through the things that you believe God is showing you in his word. 
Remember last week we had the, the puzzle up here and, and I showed you the big pieces and, and you and I are a piece of the puzzle, but you'll never get the pieces of the puzzle together unless you look at the big picture. And you know, my mother loved to put jigsaw puzzles together and she'd get the old card table out and put it in the middle of the living room. You couldn't wait for the puzzle to get done so she'd get it out of the way and it was there and the box was sitting right on the corner. And night after night, she'd sit there. My father would sit there, help her too. And every now and then, whoop, where did that one go? And peace get lost. You know how it is. But they sat there and worked at it, but they kept looking at the big picture. And that's why God gives us his word, to keep looking at the big picture. Because you and I are just a piece of the puzzle. And we're never going to understand God's will for our lives unless we keep looking at the big picture. Now, I believe when it's all said and done, Nehemiah will hear these wonderful words. And maybe in God's providence, he's heard them already. When Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Just to hear those words. That's what I look for one day. I just want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what he's given me, the grace that he's provided, and the grace that he provides for you. And I think this morning, it's important that what we see here is that Nehemiah did this and wasn't willing to be distracted because he gave himself not only to the application of God's word, but he wasn't allowing anything to distract him from the work that was in front of him. And sometimes we do that. We get distracted in this, this busy life. Nehemiah, now think about it. Remember we were looking at it last week? The, there was usury. The Jews were taking advantage of their brothers, and people were getting all hung up in all kinds of stuff. And we had three groups of complainers. We had the people that were complaining about this is too hard. This costs too much. We can't do this. And, and Nehemiah said, wait a minute, let's figure this out. And what he did was really sat them down and said, and without really drawing them into it, you guys need to be obedient to what God says. And we're not supposed to practice some of these things that we're doing amongst each other. Take the burden off your brothers and sisters. Don't be so hard on them. And Nehemiah reminded them. So what did Nehemiah do? Wasn't brilliant. God already given them the answer. Pay attention to my word. Okay, God, we're going to do that. Now he tells everybody else, hey, when I preached the same sermon last Sunday, there was a young fellow in the back of church, a wonderful little boy, Ethan. Ethan came running up to me at the back door, and he said, Pastor, what happened to the little boy? Because I told him to get an understanding of what Nehemiah had done last week to kind of get us where we are this week. I told him a story when I was director of Baptist Park, and our daughter Brianna was going back, and we were dropping some stuff off. She had a little boy that liked her. And as we drove around the dining hall, down the road to the cabins, this boy was on the bumper. If I had stopped, he would have been in my front seat. That's how close he was to the back of the car. So when I stopped, being the ex-director, I thought I would exert some authority. I got out of the car and looked at this little boy and says, What ails you? And the point of that and the application was that's what Nehemiah was saying. What ails you? So Ethan came to me at the back of church and says, did he stop? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? When you stop, oh yeah, he stopped. Did he find out what ails means? <laughs> because that was the funny part of the story. Because I never knew. The next day, Brianna came to me and she says, so-and-so wants to know what ails means. <laughs> Ask him what's wrong with him. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. Nehemiah says, what are you guys doing wrong? You're, you're charging each other money and interest. The scriptures say no, and he brought them back to the scripture. Unique thinking, isn't it? That we should walk by the scriptures? <laughs> that's in, in innovative. I mean, let's try that, huh? I think that's what God's wanted us to do all along. And Nehemiah knew that, and he brought them back to the scriptures. He said, hey, what ails you? Let's follow God's word. You know, straighten up and fly right. You know, that's what he, he exhorted them to do this. And that's what I think we need to understand in our lives today. So Nehemiah came up with the solutions here. He said, pay attention to God's word for the problems they were having. And now, just when he thinks things are getting smoothed out, the devil's at it again. 
Now, for some of you that are old enough and some of you are not, one of my favorite characters years and years ago, and we'll know how old you are, when Flip Wilson used to do Geraldine. And, and he'd put on the dress and make believe he was Geraldine, and he'd come on the stage and, and he says, Killer, my boyfriend, wanted to know why I spent the rent money. And I told him, the devil made me do it. <laughs> and he'd sashay, you know. And I'd laugh. I thought that was hilarious. He said, the devil made me do it. Well, we can't blame all things on the devil. But I'll tell you what, the fly is in the ointment here if we look at this sixth chapter. Because here's this guy, Sam Balatz, up at it again. He's trying to cause trouble, and he's trying to draw Nehemiah out. Say, you know what, maybe if we bump this guy off, maybe if we get rid of this guy, let's get him up to the plane of, oh, no. And here's these wonderful words that just jump out at you. And, and when he says in the second verse, come, let us meet together in the, one of the villages on the plane of, oh, no, he says, no, and, he, and he, what does he say in that verse 3? And, and I think this is important for each one of you. If you're trying to live the Christian life, if you, are you even thinking about living the Christian life? If you're trying to apply the Christian life to your life, this is something you need to think about and say for yourself. He says, I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? There's a lot of things in this life that want to distract us from following Jesus Christ. And the work that's going on in your life is so important that you don't have time to go down to that. Remember, we've talked about if you want to be in God's will, you need to kind of stay be between these two mountain ranges. You want to stay in this valley. One mountain range is being God's providence, God's sovereignty. The other is his moral will, which we see in the word of God. And if you stay centered between those two mountain ranges and keep straight, you're going to be in God's will. And Sam, Sam Balat tried to get Nehemiah away, but Nehemiah knew this. And he says, oh no, I'm not going up to oh no. You're going to try to bump me over the head or give me, we used to say in the city in New York, in Brooklyn, we used to call it an alley apple. An alley apple was a brick. You never wanted to get hit in the head with an alley apple, you know. And somebody would want to throw an alley apple and take advantage of you. You never walk down dark alleys by yourself. You, you knew certain things not to do. And here Nehemiah knew not to fool around with these guys. The people went back to work. Things are getting done, and they got the wall done. And so did the enemy. He went back to work, and ne Sambalat had this aim to keep his attacks on the leader. Many of God's people will never realize here on earth, by the way, Many of God's people will never realize here on earth what God has done for them in protecting them through some of the situations. There are angels, there is God's providence watching over us to keep us through some of the toughest times and we don't know. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about sitting with General Charles M. Duke. They were at a dinner party, and Charles M. Duke, for you that don't remember, and most of us are in that box, he told them all about Apollo 16 and the lunar vehicle. You see, General Duke had been one of the astronauts on Apollo 16. So they're sitting there at the dinner party, and Chuck Swindoll decides to ask the general, he says, you know, when you're up there, do you ever get a chance to do what you want to do? You know, you ever get a little freedom when you're up there on the moon? You know, do you have a few moments to kick some moon rocks around or just to take a little stroll? And the general said, sure, Chuck, if you didn't want to return to Earth. He described the intricate plan, the exact and precise instructions, the essential discipline, the instant obedience that was needed right down to the split second. By the way, he told them that uh, when they got on the moon, they were heavy. Heavy is a term that they use that means that they have more fuel than they needed. So he said they landed heavy. And he said, well, how much is that? Well, we had plenty of fuel left, he says. 
enough for another minute. That was being heavy. They had enough fuel for another 60 seconds. That's how precise this had to be. And they landed with only these 60 seconds of fuel remaining. And talk about being exact. Chuck says, I got the distinct impression from talking to this general, this astronaut, who'd walked on the moon, that whoever represents the United States in the space program must have an unconditional respect for authority. You don't have a second to think for yourself. You've got to follow the plan. You've got to follow what's been laid out for you. This morning, I'd like to ask each and every one of us the question, do you have an unconditional respect for the authority of the Word of God? I think we've lost a lot in our nation. I think we've lost a lot where people have been given so much. And spiritual leadership especially is especially a costly thing. Sam Balat here invited Nehemiah to a friendly meeting on this plane of Mono, and Nehemiah refused, and, and God separated servants, dare not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalms 1-1. If somebody's out there and they're just, and, and I'm going to use my expression, they're out there, their minds are gone, and they're just out there, you don't go to them for moral advice. You don't go to them for the kind of advice that you think they're going to help you out. Now, I'm not saying you don't go to anybody for advice. If somebody's got a good advice about buying a good set of tires, take them up on it. You go down to the fly shop and they tell you this is a good Adam's fly to go catch trout with, you listen to them. But when it comes to moral issues, you need to look to the Word of God. And so many of our leaders nowadays don't do that. I was told a story just this last week of a church in the Bangor area where the pastor stood up and preached a whole sermon and never once referred to the Word of God. Again, I ask the question, do you have an unconditional respect for the authority of God's word? So many in this world today will try to drive a wedge between you and what God wants for you in your life. I was so surprised last week watching 60 Minutes. You could tell I'm a 60 Minutes kind of guy. I like 60 Minutes. Jeremy Lin was on there. Now, if you don't know who Jeremy Lin was, he was a Chinese fellow that played basketball and became in sensation with the New York Knicks. I'm sorry, Gene and Vern. And, and the Knicks were stupid and got rid of him. <laughs> and now he plays for Houston. And what's so big about Jeremy Lin? Well, first of all, he was a great ball player. And he did well. And as I was watching TV, all of a sudden on 60 Minutes, he stands up because there's a new thing called Linsational. <laughs> Linsanity. They, the NBA, when he was hitting the numbers, couldn't sell his jerseys fast enough. They couldn't make them fast enough. And they had the commissioner of the NBA on there saying, wow. And you know what really made it amazing? He came from a, a, not a college basketball giant. He came from Harvard. He graduated from Harvard with a degree in financing. And he's playing now, making millions of dollars <laughs> for the NBA. Why did I bring up Jeremy Lin? Because he stood up in a room with thousands of young people and said the greatest thing you can do in your life is give your life to Jesus Christ. After I got off the floor and back in my chair, <laughs> wow, 60 minutes. Yeah. Come to find out that him and Tebow, Tim Tebow, have been going around doing conferences and speaking when they can. I was amazed. Now here is the son of two Chinese immigrants who came to the United States and they did well. They both got really high degrees in engineering, but they were believers. They found Jesus Christ and their walk through life. And as believers, they raised their children to be God-fearing young people. And here he is, this millionaire, this phenon in the basketball world, is still walking around honoring his mother and father and honoring the God he was introduced to. 
and telling people about Jesus Christ. I was amazed. Sometimes in this life, though, I can't imagine the, the, the temptations he might go through. You know, here's this guy, Sambalat, talking to Nehemiah and saying, hey, you know, we're good friends, we're okay. And that's what the devil will do. Beware of the smiles of the enemy, for Satan is more dangerous when he appears to be your friend than at any other. And I can't imagine in an NBA situation for a single young man the, 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 the temptations and the pressure that might be on him. Well, hopefully, keeping the Lord in center and walking in his will, he'll understand. But Sanballat was a guy who was trying to be a, a really good friend to Nehemiah. Nehemiah knew something. He might have known something from the Godfather. Mario Puzo's story of the Godfather and da, uh, Vito Corleone says to his son Michael when he's giving him advice to take over as the new Godfather, he says, keep your friends close to you. Keep your enemies closer. And that's been quoted quite a bit. And even though he was being nice to these guys, he knew that Sambalat was up to no good. When you're trying to develop a spiritual outlook in your life, when you're asking God for a vision for your life, and maybe a vision within a church and what a church should do, there's going to be all kinds of forces that are going to come along to, to try to distract that. God has prepared us in many ways. But one of the things I want us to understand this morning is that a completion, as we are developing and asking God for a vision in our lives, the completion of certain aspects of our Christian walk will be a key. Now, what are some of those? Well, the first thing is you'll have a desire for the things of the Lord. If you're applying yourself to God's word, if you're spending time in prayer, and I've been honing this week after week, trying to remind us that if we find that special moment where we give every day a moment, some time to him, and we go to the word, and we go to him in prayer, if we spend time fellowshipping and coming to church and worshiping together corporately, you're going to want to be in the company of God's people. Because we fellowship in a like-mindedness. We're walking not in our way, but in God's way. That's what's so important. And that's what our focus is. It is God's thing. And Nehemiah knew this. And there's going to be goals to do activities that bring you closer to God spiritually. I told you... Maybe one of you are, are trying to read the Bible through, and I think you should. Uh, I'm doing the, um, I told you a couple weeks ago, I'm doing the New Testament twice this year and the whole Bible uh, once. But I'm taking time to set aside a different translation. When I finish the ESV, the English Standard Version, I'm going to a new translation. Keep ch changing your translations. Keep knowing and honing in on the Word of God. Know when you pick up a piece of scripture what it says and know whether it's a good or bad translation. Know what you're working with. Know the document. Because if you don't know the word of God, you're not going to know much. Do you ever try to make a recipe without some instructions? And remember what we said, Bible's an acronym. Basic information before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. And that's what God wants us to know. He's preparing us for that worship that we're going to be doing, that work we're going to be doing for him. So it's important that we know the Word of God. I had a, a, a story I told about a friend of mine very close, and I think I probably told this more than once. If I have, forgive me for boring you. But he got a phone call from his brother-in-law, who was a big mucky muck in the Masons, and he says, I'm going up for this big ceremony tomorrow. Where in the Bible do I find the 23rd Psalm? Now, I wasn't his brother-in-law. I would have said it's right after the 22nd Psalm just in front of the 24th Psalm. You know, why don't you find the Psalms and go through till you find 23? But here they base everything they say they're doing on the Bible. But you don't know it. You can't be you ain't doing much with it. You know? I saw a story the other day made me laugh about the woman that called the police on her cell phone. And she says, my car's been stripped. They've taken everything. They ripped the dashboard out, the steering wheels. Everything's missing. And the cop shows up, and he calls the station house. He said, never mind. She climbed into the back seat. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get confused in life, and we lose our bearings. And when we lose our bearings, we wonder why life isn't going the way it's supposed to. We're supposed to stay centered on the word of God. 
Four invitations we see in that fourth verse. And Nehemiah refused them all. I, listen, remember this. I am doing a great work and cannot come down. You ought to say that in your life. When someone says, hey, you're getting ready to do your devotions early in the morning, whatever time, I like the morning because if I do it at night, I'm asleep. So I have to do it in the morning. I'm that kind of person. Some people do it at lunch. I don't care when you do it. Find a time to be away with the Lord each day. And if someone distracts from that, I'm doing a great work and I can't come right now. There you go. Tell them. The phone rings. Can't answer that. I'm doing a great work. By the way, answer machines are cheap enough nowadays. I'm doing a great work, and I can't come down. Nehemiah wasn't going to be distracted, and, and what happened? They built up the wall. Wow. Is God greater? Is God great? So you'll be able to look back when you're doing these things, and you'll be able to say, look what God's doing in my life. If you want to read through the Bible in a year, a year from now, you say, wow, I just read through the whole Bible. Then you start again. Pick it up at the point you missed the first time. I do. I do. Every time I read through the Bible, I've got to go back because I said I knew that. I had a woman, I'll tell you what, and this is a confession. Many years ago, a woman walked out of church up in Stockholm. She had been there for a while, and I felt really bad. She was mad at me and didn't think I should be preaching because I had forgotten about the curse on the city of Jericho. Now, for some of you that are Bible students, you go look it up. But there's a curse on the city of Jericho that if anybody rebuilt it, they'd lose their first son. And when it was completed, they'd lose their, their last son. And a guy went and done it. And guess what he lost? Two sons. And I had forgotten that. And this woman thought I wasn't fit to preach and never came back to church. Well, I feel bad, but, you know, I knew it. I had forgotten it. But, you know, the more you read, the fresher you keep. The more you read, it's not stale. The more you read, things start to make sense. One key for Nehemiah was the completion of the wall. He looked back and he said, look what God has done. Not him, not the people, what God has done. He could look back and see what God has done in their lives. And the people also knew what God had been involved in. Or this work, this great work we see in chapter 6, would have never been completed. Question. What's God doing in your life? What's God doing in your life today? I think that's a question each and every one of us has to ask. The second thing I want to bring out this morning, it's a clear demonstration. If you're giving yourself to the Word of God, you're giving yourself to, to whatever you believe God is leading you to, but especially honing in on His Word, you'll be able to say, this is what God has done. Look at the 16th verse. I want to take you down. We didn't read it. Verse 16, he says, when all our enemies heard about this, the wall going up, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized, listen, loved ones, that this work had been done with the help of our God. I wouldn't have gone to school this year as much as I did if, if the blessings hadn't come. I walked in one day, and I think I've mentioned this, and there was a great amount of money paid anonymously on my bill. I said, wow. I went in after February, and another great amount of money was put there, and they said it was me that put it there, and I said, no, it wasn't, because it all was in cash, and they, they photocopied the cash so they could go in the file and the envelope. And I said, I didn't put that down. I, I was out of town that day. I couldn't have. I didn't do that. When you look back at the things in your life that have brought you here, I think most of us have to stop and say, God did that. God did that. And that's what Nehemiah could see here. And if you can do that in your life, you know that God is working in you. And it becomes a God thing happening in your life. And in our little church, God is doing a God thing. I'm seeing a God thing. Almost five years down the road now, a God thing. We didn't do it. God does it. By his spirit, he moves. By his providence, he moves. By his plans. And I know it's a God thing. And here, as we close, I want to remind you of this. Don't get so happy yet. There will still be opposition. 
and criticism. Verse 6, what did Sanballat say to him? He's saying that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king. How crazy is that? But don't let the opposition bother you. I'll tell you why. General Chesty Puller was a general during the Korean War. And they landed at Incheon. And there was Koreans in front of them. There was North Koreans on that flank and North Koreans on that flank. And behind them as they landed was the ocean. And General Puller says, good, they won't get away this time. <laughs> and that's our attitude. Don't worry about the criticism. Don't worry about the opposition. Don't worry about what the devil's going to send you. Trust God and trust in him alone. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And we need to remind ourselves that if we're trusting in Jesus Christ, if we're trusting in God, I got nothing to worry about. I tell you what, I'm whistling. <laughs> Yesterday there was a big discussion at the seminary about all kinds of political things. And I said, I'm not listening to any of you. I'm not. I don't care what the government wants to do, how it's going to do it, I don't care. Because God and me are a majority. And he's promised to take care of me, to never leave me, to never forsake me. He's guaranteed that he's going to go before me. And I'll tell you why. I'm not in that room by myself. He's promised you the same things, that he'd provide for us, and that he'd love us and take care of us. Remember to keep God and his word in your focus. Obey his word. Don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways. In all your ways, acknowledge him and let him direct your paths. That's the greatest proverb you can read. It's telling you trust God and nothing else. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways. You go to the store, you know what we do. We get in the car if we're going on a trip. Lord, thank you for this trip. Now, I'm asking him, maybe one day he'll give me a nicer car, but it's his car, it ain't mine. You know, Lord, we like your Taurus. The paint's coming off it, but that's okay. If you put 200,000 miles on a car, the paint comes off it. But it's your car, so you just keep us going down the road. Watch over us. Take care of the house. Take care of the parsonage. Take care of the church. Take care of the people. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Phone rings, I, I pray. I don't know who's on here, but Lord, be, be, be with this. Keep me. Keep me honoring you. Don't let me get upset about anything. You're okay. Hi. You know. In all your ways, acknowledge him and let him direct your path. As we close, remember, each one of you, I want to I give you this exhortation this morning. Remember, time is short. Opportunity is knocking. Please answer it. Be obedient to his word. We have the opportunity to be obedient. I had to write a paper for seminary this week, and I, I wrote this in there. The age-old aphorism remains true. Four things come not back. The spoken word, the spent arrow, time past, the neglected opportunity. Those four things don't come back. Are you trusting in God's word and in his saving grace today? I'd like to share with you as I close now an old Methodist hymn. I never felt a joy so fair as this that conquers my despair. The Lord of life by grace has made a space within my heart for praise. That place her long filled full runs o'er with love divine, that love before. Such grace was mine, grew in this frame, earth thought or bone possessed the same. In time's rich fullness, Jesus came to carve into my heart the fame of being found. What hurts may come, Jesus will lead and bring me home. Come then, Come all, even so by grace. For Jesus sees not rank nor race. He loves us simply as we are. 
despite our sin, in every scar. So do not fear the judgment more. His love above all else is sure. In him all brokenness is sealed. All woundedness in him is healed. Trust in Jesus and him alone. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. <laughs> we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. Heavenly Father, we honor you this morning. And Father, we know that the life that we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God, your Son, Jesus. And we put our trust in him and in him alone. Father, I'd ask that each heart here would look at themselves and understand where they are in regards to Jesus. And Father, I pray that each heart here would trust in Jesus. And Father, now as we complete our worship time, give us Jesus. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.